we have moved through four of the seven churches. We have moved from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamos to Thyatira, and now we're getting ready to jump into Sardis. So we've made a lot of progress in the book of Revelation. Part of the reason why we're going slowly through the seven churches is because if you understand the seven churches, you will have the foundation to understand the rest of the book of Revelation. Everything after that is just laid over the foundation of the churches. And from here on, most everything is repeat and enlarge. With the Church of Sardis, if we're uh, following the historical sequence, it's moving us into the latter time of the Reformation, when things really begin to intensify. We closed out our last church in our last study, but let's go back for a moment to Revelation 2, verses 24 to 29. But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh, and keep my words, or my works, unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations and he shall rule over them with a rod of iron, and the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Revelation 2, 24-29 This is referring to the Reformers or honest men and women who stood for the truth that were within the medieval church during the time of apostasy. There were men and some women who stood for the truth. As mentioned in our last lesson, Wycliffe is understood to be the morning star of the Reformation, of whom made this statement, Trust wholly in Christ. Rely altogether on his sufferings. Beware of seeking to be justified in any other way than by his righteousness. Why was he called the morning star? Because Christ the morning star used Wycliffe to bring the Bible to the people. And the Bible, the word of God, is a revelation of Christ. In fact, in John 1, 1 and 14, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Then in verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. To clarify, Wycliffe brought the Bible to the people, which is a revelation of Jesus. It's the morning star. Wherefore, wherefore we have that double-edged sword spoken of in Pergamos, that morning star promise that was made at Thyatira and realized in Sardis. Wycliffe wasn't alone. There were many others. We have Calvin, Luther, Huss, Zwigli, Jerome, all of these started out in the Apostolic Church, yet they were not alone in bringing about change. There were still others. The Christian Church of the time was one big colossal system, where there was no other churches. When they saw the truths of the Bible, such as Martin Luther, who found a Bible chained to the pulpit. Their minds were opened to the light of the truth. Although the Bible wasn't uh, as readily available then, Martin Luther started uh, reading it. He was so amazed and just couldn't wait to share with the church because he thought all the leaders would say, oh, yeah, that's what we need to do. But he didn't anticipate how hard their hearts had become. And so the Reformation began, and that's what's happening to the church in Sardis. Turn in your Bible to Revelation 3, verse 1, and read all the way through to verse 6. That's Revelation 3, verses 1 to 6. And under the church of Sardis write, These things saith he, 
that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, and I know thou hast the name that thou livest and are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Revelation 3, verses 1 to 6. The message to Sardis is addressed to the Protestant reformers. The period covered by Thyatira was during the, er, during the era of papal persecution. Uh, this church was once the church of God. One of the candlesticks among which the Son of Man was seen to walk. But then that organization prostituted itself by joining hands with the state, when in other words, it followed the example of Balaam and worked the works of Jezebel. The oil was withheld from the candlestick and given to those who were willing to obey God in preference to the head of the church, the Pope. God regards character, not name. And the faithful few to whom the light was entrusted were mentioned in a part of the message of the, to Thyatira. They were the ones who knew not the works of Jezebel. These became the forerunners of Protestantism. As we look at the Church of Sardis, where we see the forerunners of Protestantism, they were coming out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter two nine, and they, when they're learning, they're growing, but their followers, the Reformed Church, will be stopping. Their works are not made perfect before God, because they're not continuing, and yet they are told to continue and strengthen that which remains, and which is ready to die. Revelation three two. It says. At the end of Revelation 3 3, you're not going to know what hour I'm going to come upon you. God is not being arbitrary here. Basically, the Reformation never really stopped. The Reformation from the darkness had to continue on, and God could only give a light, a little light, at a time. Note that during the 1260 years, of darkness. Some of the reformers we spoke of came at different times, primarily during the two periods of the church history. First, near the end of Thyatira, but mostly during the time period of Sardis, and their location differed too. In Scotland, we had John Knox, George Wishart, and Patrick Hamilton. In France, we had Jacques de Fervry, uh, Louis de Berin, and John Calvin. In Switzerland, we had Jurek Zwigli and Jonas, whose last name I can't even pronounce, William Fairs, and Antoni uh, Froment. In Netherlands, we had uh, Menno Simmons. In Germany, we had Philip, uh, Melanchthon, and Martin Luther. In Denmark, we had Hans Tassen. In Sweden, we had Ulf uh, Petri and Laurentius Petri. In Bohemia, we had John Huss and Jerome. In England, we had George uh, Whitfield and John Wesley, John uh, Bunyan, 
William Tyndale, and John Wycliffe. Later, after the founding of the new uh, world, more American reformers will come into prominence. Jesus once said to his disciples, I've got so many things I want to tell you, but you can't bear them all right now. Note John 16, verse 12. Remember that with many, when they are coming out of darkness and moving into his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2, 9, they are learning so much so fast. But there were things that they didn't understand yet. And then God says, whoa, hold on, because sometimes we just want to back up and to, to someone and just dump the whole truckload on them, everything. But they can't bear it. John 16, verse 12. It's too much. And this is what's happening with the Reformation. So God was trying to encourage them, keep moving forward. Uh, consider 1 Corinthians 9, verses 23 to 25. Many of them stopped moving, but thankfully not all, though the majority started splintering into little groups. Martin Luther didn't want a Lutheran church. He wanted them to keep running the good race, climbing higher and learning more. But they stopped. And what's the result? If you stop, you won't be led to the end of the 2300-day prophecy. You will be left in the dust, so to speak. Christ is trying to lead them to the judgment. That's where the runners of the race are going. But of those left in the dust, Christ says, well, I'm going to come on you on a day you're not aware of. If you stop, if your works are not perfect, and you're satisfied with the way things are, with the status quo, then when the judgment message comes to its fulfillment, you're not going to be aware of it. You're going to turn against the judgment message. That's exactly what a lot of these churches or denominations did. God's people had to come out of them eventually because the judgment message came. He then promised, if you overcome, you're going to be clothed with white robes. That's judgment talk. And your name is not going to be blotted out of the book. Again, that's judgment talk. Remember where we are in this period. Remember time and location, right? Time, 1260, location, holy place. We're seeing language now being introduced that's pointing us forward to the next of the three time prophecies, the 2300 days. Now we know that the 2300 days are coming up after the fifth church, Sardis. So we should be looking for events to occur that will involve 1844 and the most holy place because we're being introduced to it in the language. Since we're in the 1260, I know that indicator, events must be coming up that are going to point me to 2300. That's why we say that these three time markers are crucial to understanding. Do you know how in the old days after they washed clothes, they would hang them on clotheslines some of us even still do it. Well, the time prophecies are the clotheslines. Everything in the book of Revelation hangs within the context of one of those three time prophecies. The language we have here about coming as a thief, about the white robe, and about not being blotted out of the book, they are all pointing forward to judgment, strengthening those things which remain before they die the second death. Note Revelation 3.2. Let's look at Revelation 3.1. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. What are the seven spirits of God? We already covered most of this in previous lessons. Uh, note Lesson 6 and Level 2 summary up to now. One of the things that we can look at here is another aspect of the star or branch, Isaiah 11. It's a prophecy. The whole chapter can be divided in half. 
The first half of Isaiah 11 is a prophecy of Christ, and the second half is a prophecy that would apply to us in the end time too. What we call the loud cry, the outpouring of the Spirit in the end time. The reason why we can turn to Isaiah 11 is because this chapter is going to help us as we move into the next section of Revelation, the seals, because there's a reference to this again in the seals, in Isaiah 11.1. 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch. Does your Bible have a capital B for the branch? Because that's referring to Jesus, who was from the lineage of David, Isaiah 55, verses 3 to 5. A branch shall grow out of his root. Now, Jesse was the father of David, okay? So the branch that comes out of this root of Jesse, the root of Jesse is referring to David, but really it's referring to Christ because Christ is the root of David. The bright and morning star or a son of righteousness with healing in his wings, Malachi 4.2. Therefore, the branch that's coming out here is referring to Christ, and that goes on in verse 2 to describe what would be Christ's experience. Isaiah 11.2 says, The Spirit of the Lord rests upon him. Okay, that's number one, the Spirit of the Lord. Number two, the Spirit of Wisdom. Three, the Spirit of Understanding. Four, the count of counsel and might, five, of might, six, the spirit of knowledge, and seven, of the fear of the Lord, which we could call respect for the Father. What's it talking about here in the sevenfold spirit? It's simply the complete spirit of God. Isaiah picks up and breaks it down. The spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might. He breaks it down and he says, it's the full Spirit of God is going to rest upon Jesus. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He is the one being referred to in Sardis. See Revelation 3, 1. Let's pause for a moment to examine this branch in context of the Old Testament parallel. Can you think of a story in the Old Testament that illustrates the effect of the branch in our lives? Let me give you a hint with a verse from the New Testament. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up, James 4.10. If he's lifting us up, then that suggests we have sunk down, perhaps down into the water. Sound familiar? Does that remind you of when Peter tried to walk on, on the water, but began to sink when he looked back? Then Christ, the branch, the rod, lifted him up. Well, what about the story in 2 Kings 6, 1 to 6. Let's look at 2 Kings 6, verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. 2 Kings 6, 1. What does it mean, too straight? It means too narrow, or a tight place. The students in attendance at the school had become so numerous they could no longer be accommodated in the available quarters. This suggests there was much interest in the light of the bright morning star or in the truly good education they were receiving from Elisha. Therefore, they needed to expand, to branch out. So it was with the reformers in the Christian church. They too needed to expand, to branch out, to get out so they could grow. Yet, in the attempts of the students of Elisha to expand, a problem arose with the axe head. See 2 Kings 6 5. So, what did Elisha do? Let's read 2 Kings 6 6. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in hither, or thither. And the iron did swim. 2 Kings 6 6. As iron represents the the basis of the kingdoms of men, we could say that Christ, the branch, is able to miraculously draw even the basis of men unto himself. He said in John 12, verse 32, I will draw all men unto me. 
he lifts man up from being buried in sin, just as water is a symbol of the grave of baptism, from being lost, as the axe head was, and restores him or lifts him up from his fallen condition as the axe head fell. The axe head being brought to the surface could symbolize the spiritually resurrecting power of Christ. The branch, which results in complete unity with him, just as when the axe head was joined to the stick again. Then, together, they form an instrument of service. Getting back to Revelation 3.1, it says here, And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write these things, saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, and that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Revelation 3.1 who is this person speaking here? That's Jesus. That's the branch. He's got the seven spirits of God. He has completeness. He's filled with the complete fullness of God's spirit. What did he tell Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. John 14 verse 9. In him was the fullness of the Godhead. Colossians 2, 9. Do we have the Spirit of God? Peter had the Spirit of God. When traveling to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do people say I am? See Mark 8, 27 to 30, Matthew 16, 13 to 20, and Luke 9, 18 to 20, and John 6, 66 to 71. The disciples answered, They say, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. But Jesus said, Well, who do you say I am? Peter then said, Thou art Christ. Jesus then said, For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. How does the Father in heaven reveal truth to us? When he, the Spirit of truth, 1 John 5, 6, is come, he will guide you into all truth. John 16, verse 13. God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 10, John 14, 17, and 26. And then a few verses later, Jesus says, I have to go to the cross in Gethsemane. And Peter says, No, far be it from you, Lord. And Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. Matthew 16, 23, Mark 8, 33, and Luke 4, 8. So we have the Spirit of God, which teaches us knowledge, but we also have some baggage that hinders our growth. But Jesus doesn't have any baggage. In fact, in the context of this verse, it says in Isaiah 11:3, And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity from the meek of the earth. Isaiah 11, 3-4. When a woman caught in adultery, and the very act is brought before Jesus, see John 8, 3-4, the Pharisees quote the Bible and say, Moses said she should be stoned. What do you say? John 8, 5. And Jesus has the Spirit of God. And so he says, let me just pause here to write something out in the sand. He starts writing down in the sand because he knows the whole situation. He's filled with the Spirit of God. He also wants the same for us. God wants to fill us with the Spirit so we can take in the whole situation and not just a little bit of what we see with our eyes or a little bit of what we hear with our ears so we can judge righteously. When we're looking at Sardis, 
we're also looking at the reformers. How can we find fault with the reformers? But Jesus has the full Spirit of God, so he's able to say, you're doing good, but you've got some areas where I haven't found your works perfect. There are some areas where you're slipping up. He said the same thing to Peter, and now he's saying it right here, Revelation 3, 2. So, the reference to the Spirit of God is helping us to understand Jesus sees everything. He's got full wisdom, full knowledge, full might. He's able to discern the whole picture. We look at the disciples' works and say, oh, they were great people. Well, yeah, but they had some problems, and Jesus pointed out those problems so that when he ascended after the resurrection, he could request the Spirit, the complete Spirit, be sent to fill these surrendered, consecrated vessels to begin to spread the gospel. Again, reflecting on the history of the first church, the foundation church, the church that lost its first love, its zealous, self-sacrificing love for Christ, which, as we already saw, resulted in the second love. Christ had bidden the first disciples love one another as he had loved them. After the descent of the Holy Spirit, when the disciples went forth to proclaim a living Savior, their one desire was the salvation of souls. They rejoiced in the sweetness of communion with the saints, the brethren. They were tender throughout, self-denying, willing to make any sacrifice for the truth's sake. In their daily association with one another, they revealed the love that Christ had enjoined upon them. Remember how we've been cross-checking with his? So this powerful entity that Sardis is described as coming out of is a far cry from the first church, which is why it's symbolically represented as Jezebel or Babylon. So what you have here is the reformers coming out of Babylon and becoming the, or beginning the process of reform. Notice what it says about these reformers in verse 2. Be watchful. Do you remember a group that came out of Babylon who were supposed to be watchful? I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silent, and give him no rest till he establish until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth, Isaiah 62, verses 6 to 7. Those who stand in responsible positions in the word of the Lord, the reformers, are represented as watchmen on the walls of Zion. uh, God calls upon them to sound an alarm among the people. Let it be heard in all the plains. The day of woe or a wasting and destruction is upon all who do unrighteousness. With special uh, severity will the Lord's hand fall upon the watchmen, the reformers, who fail to place before the people in clear lines their obligation to him who by creation and by redemption is their own. What were the watchmen being called to do? What did we just read? Strengthen the things which remain, Revelation 3, 2. What were they to strengthen? Let's go back to what we saw in the churches. First church, we saw pointed us to the perfect church that eventually fell from their first love. That reminds us of Adam and Eve. Second church, persecution reminds us of the next book, the book of Exodus, the children of Israel in captivity. The next church, compromise. We saw that exactly what happened to the children of Israel when they entered the promised land, they began to compromise. Fourth church, Jezebel, Babylon. We saw that right in line with the Old Testament history. The children of Israel, because their compromise ended up in Babylonian captivity. Fifth church, Martin Luther basically makes 
a decree, if you will. He nails these theses on the door, and as a result, people start to leave Babylon. And the uh, support of Babylon begins to dry up. They leave Babylon because they're going to begin a work of reform or reformation. Guess what happens next in the Old Testament history? The same thing. A decree is made by a man named Cyrus, Ezra 1, who opens the gates of Babylon to set the captives free so that they can go back and begin the work of redemption or reformation. Begin the work of building the house of the Lord. So there's just an amazing parallel. But guess what happens after that? When the years, when years later, they finally uh, go back to uh, strengthen the walls of, of Zion to build the house of the Lord, that which remains. Nehemiah wants to know the situation of Jerusalem. He asks, what about those who have escaped from Babylon and are supposed to be building the house of the Lord in Jerusalem? What's the situation there? See Nehemiah chapter 1. And what does he hear? They're building their own houses while the house of the Lord is still in ruins. That's what we're seeing right here. We got something, or we got somewhat of a picture of this in the previous, in the previous lesson. What happened with the Reformation? Everyone started building their own houses, denominations. God intended for one house, but the reformers that began the Reformation eventually, if they lived long enough, they saw it stopping. That is to say, the reformers' followers specifically stopped the reform that the reformers had begun, which resulted in all these different houses or denominations. They all have a little something but the house of the Lord is being neglected. God is pointing forward now to a time when he is going to bring them into accountability and bring a message that's going to call them out of all these little, little uh, splinter groups into one church. We see, for example, a special group that's referenced by their garments. Verse 4, you'll walk with me in white and you will not be blotted out of the book, Revelation 3, 5. The Lamb's book of life is what this is talking about. Two things that stand out. The first thing that stands out is that their names will not be blotted out of the book of life. The whole idea of once saved, always saved, is contradicted by this, because if your name is in the book of life, you're saved. If your name is not in the book of life, you're not, and your name can be blotted out because Jesus says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name. So your name can be blotted out if you do not continue to overcome. As Paul says, I die daily, and that's the only verse you need to see. Once you're saved, you're not necessarily sealed into a saved state, though there are many verses in the Bible that would also support this concept, but just this one should be sufficient. Remember the first church we looked at was the perfect church, but then it lost its first love. Remember that Lucifer was once saved in heaven. Was he always saved? Once saved? is not saved now. So if a perfect angel could fall from the grace of God, fall from his position, then what makes us think that we can't fall? That's the mistake that Lucifer and angels made in heaven. Oh yeah, well, God's not going to do anything. We can do whatever we want to do. There's not going to be consequences. And what happened? They were cast out of heaven. So, just looking at history, and that should be enough to show that the idea of once saved, always saved, is not in accordance with the scriptures. 
now that the whole thing with Lucifer falling out of heaven and all that, it shows us how dangerous pride is because if he would have repented and truly been sorry for what he did, God would have forgiven him. Because God is the same yesterday and today and forever, Hebrews 13.8, but Lucifer rejected that mercy. He was so proud, so unwilling to accept the offer of mercy, he too lost his first love. I would like to bring out the story of Manasseh, for example, 2 Kings 21. He was a wicked king. He came from Ahab. And do you think Ahab was bad? Manasseh was worse, so bad that God took him to Babylon. 2 Chronicles 33 verse 11. There's two records, repeat and enlarge, two records of history. One is found in 2 Kings and the other is in 2 Chronicles. If you read 2 Kings, Manasseh is lost. He was taken captive. captive. He's done. Then you read Second Chronicles. After he's taken captive, he turns his face to the Lord. He repents, and the Lord restores him and takes him back to Israel, back to Judah. And he fortifies, and then he knew that the Lord was God. Second Chronicles 33, verse 13. So once lost, not always lost. Once saved, not always saved. Number two of what stands out. Consider what we learned about once saved, always saved. If you actually look at these uh, chosen people in the time of Christ, they were like, yeah, we're Abraham's seed. And since we're Abraham's seed, Jesus, there's nothing that even you can do about it. Once saved, always saved was one of the biggest mistakes that the Jewish nation made in their theology. We are the chosen forever, was the concept. And there's nothing that can happen to change that. We are informed by the book of Revelation, the Bible, and the history of the Bible, that this nation, Israel, that was a chosen people, of which contained Saul, Solomon, and others, we recognize in their experience the fact that God is merciful to every repentant sinner. Though they may have strayed, if they repent, he will take them back. Why so many denominations? A lot of people say Christians read the Bible. So why then do we have so many denominations? In other words, why isn't it just clear? Why can't I just read the Bible and know this is where I'm supposed to be? I know people who wonder why there are so many denominations. The Church of Sardis answers that, and history addresses that. Sardis depicts the time of the Reformation, at which point many reformers stopped at a certain point and didn't continue progressing. Martin Luther, Righteousness by Faith, the Baptist, Baptism by Immersion, Calvinist, Methodist, all these little groups hunkered around these individuals was not God's will. Yet God used it as part of the reform or reformation, as we saw illustrated in Lesson 9 and other lessons. God will always find a select few who continued to reform. We can see that whatever happens with the new, next church also it has to deal with the house of the Lord. It has to do with bringing everyone into one house or to one table. That brings the whole Bible together. So we're just cross-checking it. We know that our interpretation is right because it's following the history of the Old Testament to a T. So if you know the history of the Old Testament, then you, or then we have um, most everything we need to understand the whole book of Revelation. We will continue the study in, of Sardis, the papal church, in our next lesson with part two, where we will examine another aspect of the issue of denominations with regards to the sanctuary.